this session, as, as you heard, is about plastics. And plastics are ubiquitous in our society. It's really hard to have any sort of conversation about waste reduction, waste prevention, without plastics coming up. And a lot of that is because so many of the materials that we use today are plastics, so we inevitably have to deal with them when we start to have a waste discussion. Today, we're really fortunate to have three people join us that are going to really help us in this conversation. So we have Mike Biddle, Toby Reed, and Jermaine Archibald. We're hoping that this session is going to create some really good discussion around the myths surrounding plastics, recycling some of the opportunities going forward, and to talk about how the industry can really um, develop going forward in terms of having more waste reduction, recycling, better environmental impacts around plastics. I also want to remind you to use the pigeonhole uh, system, which is working really well for our questions, because we'll be using that at the end of the session to actually put some of the questions together, as well as we'll go to the floor mics as well. So without further ado, I'm going to get us started by introducing Mike Biddle. Mike is the founder and director of MBA Polymers. Mike started MBA over 20 years ago. It has grown to become the world's leading multinational company recovering plastics from end-of-life durable goods. Mike has received numerous international awards, and his TED Talk, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, because I certainly saw it before um, I knew Mike was coming to this conference, has been seen around the world. So without further ado, let's welcome Mike. Well, thank you for that warm welcome, and also thank you for inviting me to this beautiful city uh, to talk about such an important topic, and that is zero waste, and specifically a topic that I'm obviously a little biased about, and that's how to turn plastic waste into plastic resources. So I consider plastic waste to be one of the last frontiers in recycling, which means it's both a challenge and an opportunity. I'm going to be wearing two hats today, one as founder of M and director of MBA Polymers, the company I started over 20 years ago to harvest plastic from complex waste streams, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And also as a new organization I started uh, earlier this year called Material Solutions, where I work with the two sides of that business, if you will, the sourcing side, helping uh, generators and aggregators of plastic waste figure out or waste how to get more value out of their waste streams and also end users on how to use more recycled materials in their products and how to design those products intelligently with the use of uh, renewable resources or resources that we've recovered. I like to start a lot of my talks with this photograph. Um, how many of you remember this scene from the 1960s movie The Graduate? This is an age test for those out there. <laughs> This is a young Dustin Hoffman, and he just graduated from college. This is a family friend that takes him aside, and he whispers into his, his ear, the future is... See, you remember that line. It's one of the most memorable lines in movie history because it was a joke. No kid in their right mind in the 60s wanted to enter the chemical or plastics industry because it wasn't hip or cool. But whoever put that line in the movie knew what they were talking about. This is the growth rate of plastics since about the time of that movie in the 60s to present day. And plastics have eclipsed the growth weight rate of most other materials. That's why we find them in just about everything we come into contact with on a daily basis in our lives. In fact, to even put that in more dramatic perspective, plastics are now, we, we now produce and consume more plastics on a volume basis around the world than steel. In fact, that, we eclipsed that point in the late 80s. There's about 260, or today it's about 280 million tons of plastic produced and consumed each and every year around the world. So there's a lot of this stuff out there, as we all know. The reuse rate of that plastics, however, pales in comparison to most other materials. Here I'm using steel as a proxy <coughs> for steel and other valuable materials. The recycle rate for plastics in the US is less than 8%, according to the US EPA. I think it's a bit higher in Canada, but not much and some places in the world maybe just slightly higher. Now, most people think that's because plastics are a low-value, throwaway material. But actually, if you compare plastics to steel, for example, it's three to four to five times more valuable on a price-per-weight basis. So that begs the question, if there's so doggone much of this material out there in the world, and it's such a valuable commodity, 
Why is its reuse and recovery rate so minuscule compared to that of a lower value material like steel? Well, I think it's primarily for two major big reasons. One is that plastics just started coming back in a, a large organized fashion around the world, what I like to talk, call the first mile problem, getting the plastics from each of your households to a place where it can be recovered. And secondly, and most importantly, it's not easy. So let me talk briefly about each of these challenges. Plastics have started now coming back in a much more aggregated fashion. This is a MRF material recycling facility. Many of you in the room either uh, work or are associated with one of these. And you probably know in most MRFs, in, with respect to plastics, the ones and twos are the majority plastics recovered. And then there's a mixed plastic waste stream that is usually traded somewhere else, and I'll talk about that. And that's sort of the, the difficult stream, and it's even been more difficult the last couple of years. Electronics, and Canada is certainly way ahead of the US with respect to electronics management. Um, those materials are shredded, and the valuable metals are recovered, and there's what's left over is what's called ESR, electronic shredder residue, similar from large appliances. Automobiles, another very large stream of uh, products that are recovered at end of life uh, for the metals, and what's left over is called shredder residue after the metals are, sh are recovered by large shredders, many operating here in Canada. In the US alone, we put in landfills about 5 million tons each and every year of shredder residue, just shredder residue. So these are big volumes of plastic-rich streams that have traditionally not been harvested, but they're starting to be aggregated in very large volumes. So that means the first mile problem at least has started to being addressed, particularly in places with forward-thinking policy, like Canada, Europe, and Asia. I can't put the US on there yet, we're working on it. So why are plastics such a challenge? If we've got it aggregated, and then there's so much of it, and it's so valuable, why in the world aren't we recovering it? Well, there's lots of reasons. I'm going to try to keep it very simple. The main reason is it's not easy to sort from all the other materials in the waste stream or from one another. Let's compare it to metals, for example. Metals are often separated from each other, either from ore in the ground or in a recycling system from, by density, because they have very differing densities. They also have different electrical and magnetic properties, and they even have different colors. So all of these properties are exploited by either miners or metal recyclers to separate metals in a very straightforward way. If we look at plastics, plastics hover around a very narrow density range. They have overlapping densities. They have very similar electrical or non-existent electrical and magnetic properties. And even rubber and wood have very similar density electrical and magnetic properties to plastics. So it's hard to separate plastics from other materials and, of course, from one another. And any plastic can be any color. So all the traditional separation techniques for materials simply don't work for plastics. And that's the fundamental reason that plastics have not been recovered in higher uh, volumes, not because they're not valuable. Another consequence of metals being easy to recycle and plastics being difficult to recycle is that we often, particularly in the United States, send our problem materials to developing parts of the world for low-cost recycling, where people for as little as a dollar a day or a few dollars a day pick apart what they can this example is mostly e-waste. They're pulling out the metals, the circuit boards, wires, etc., and they leave behind what they can't recycle, largely the plastics and the CRT tubes. And I could show you hundreds of these photographs. And these people aren't being bad people, they're just trying to earn a living, and they're trying to sort out what a human being can recognize as valuable, and for which there's a ready market. <clears throat> in some cases, they're burning the plastics in order to get to the valuable components, in open areas like this, or even in more organized fashion in what are called burn houses. And if you go inside a burn house, there's usually a person feeding a fire. The fire burns away the organic material, often the plastic, and leaves behind a metal-rich stream. Now, this might be low cost from an economic standpoint, but it's certainly not low cost from a human health and local ecosystem standpoint. It's not safe, it's not fair, and it's not sustainable. Another consequence of plastic being difficult to recycle is it often ends up in inappropriate places. Now, this is an eyesore, of course, but this is actually much more than an eyesore. And it's not just showing up on our beaches around the world, it's in the oceans. And to, and to put that in perspective, 
This is at the Zurich Museum of Design. And you can see a person on the left of the photograph for size reference. This is how much they estimate enters the, our world's oceans every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds. I think this really helps drive home the point of how much plastic we have out there. The oceans are big, but they're not big enough to where this doesn't have consequence. And some of the consequences are, are the interaction of plastics with marine life. And I'm sure many of you have seen some of these pictures before. Um, and it's not just marine life. I even threw a picture of a camel in there, and I can show other land-based animals that have interacted with uh, garbage and uh, have not been able to digest uh, all of the garbage waste and uh, has serious impacts, obviously. Uh, you see three of those pictures in the middle are of uh, albatross, and that's been one particular problem that's been highlighted by many photographers, journalists, and so forth. And if you're not, and here the largest albatross in the world is eating plastic debris because they think it's food or there's food on the debris. Of course, they can't, not, they can't digest the debris and the consequences are dire for this bird. If you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to see a three to four minute trailer at www.midwayfilm.com. It will, it will stay with you for a very long time. It's not just the birds. Fish are eating the plastic debris in the oceans, particularly once it starts breaking down. And that's a problem, as you might imagine, because it's hard for them to digest, just like it is for the birds. But it goes even beyond that particular problem. More recently, we found that as the plastic breaks down with UV degradation and wave action in the oceans, it breaks into smaller and smaller particles. There's lots of other toxins in the oceans that we've deposited there, either deliberately or not deliberately. Some of those are hydrophobic. They don't like water, but they like the plastic. So plastic is acting, acting like little sponges, which in one case is pretty cool. Plastics are actually cleaning up some of the chemical toxins in the seas. The trouble is the fish then eat those plastic particles. The toxins reabsorb into the fish, and then we eat the fish, or other animals eat the fish. So even if this is an out of sight, out of mind problem, it's now coming back and is literally on your plate. And if you're not a fish eater, maybe you're a beer drinker. I was uh, debating whether to use this photograph or not. I just ran across this article a few days ago. So this uh, is from a study in Germany where they looked at the top beer brands in Germany and they micro-filtered the beers. And German beer law says there's only three things that can go into beer and that's it. Well, they're finding other things in beer, including plastic microparticles. In fact, 100% of the beers they tested had plastic microparticles in them. So we see scenes like this. Again, many of you have probably seen pictures like these. We're often asked, if this stuff is so concentrated, why in the world can't a company like MBA Polymers that tackles very complex waste streams why can't you recover the plastics from these streams? And indeed, these, these folks in these pictures are trying to do that. The gentleman in the lower left is picking out PET bottles. The uh, young man in the upper left sitting on the canoe, there is water underneath that boat, uh, is pulling out straws. And they're pulling out single items because they're doing human object sorting. And they know if they pick out that one object, it'll be made out of one type of plastic, probably, and they can resell that to someone and make a living. This is certainly hard to scale. Another example of people trying their best to recycle plastics, uh, this is in India. I took this picture standing on one of the largest, the tops of one of the largest slums in the world in Mumbai, India. They're storing their plastic waste on tops of the, of the houses and underneath these workspaces, literally hundreds of little dark workspaces, people are trying their best to sort out this, these plastics from one another. They're using color, feel, shape, whatever factor that a human can recognize to, to sort these plastics, and they're making a low-grade low plastics for, for low-grade uh, items and reuse. And to check the quality of that plastic, they often do what's called the burn and sniff test. And I can show you hundreds of these photos, but I'll just give you one example. This is a young lady in Ningbo, China, that, that uh, sh showed it to me, or uh, let me, allowed me to take pictures of her doing it. She lights a small particle of plastic on fire, she blows it out, and then she sniffs the fumes. And every time I see someone doing this, I say, please don't do that, it's not healthy. The usual response is, well, I don't do this, the workers do it. And I say, well, you missed the point. <laughs> it's, none of you should be doing this, please. Please don't do this. 
This is a compact disc recycling. Your compact disc has a metal foil and, and a plastic coating over that metal foil. Underneath is a very valuable plastic called polycarbonate. So people do go to extremes to try to clean off, etch off that, that coatings. I asked the gentleman that was running this, this is again in, outside of Ningbo, China, uh, what he did with this uh, chemical reactant when it was spent. And he took me around that curtain you see in the background. He showed me he dumped it in a field because he had no alternative. He's not trying to be a bad person. He's just, he had no al other alternative. So those of us in the developing world, and again, particularly the United States, send our complex, even our complex mixed plastics from MRFs, mostly go overseas for, again, informal low-cost recycling. And entire cities have built up around this industry. This is just one example in China. And they do their best to recycle the plastic, just as I've indicated in the earlier pictures. And what do they pick out? Well, they pick out the same things we pick out of our MRFs, the things that are easy for either a human or machine to recognize namely the PET bottles and the polyethylene bottles. And the residual that they can't sort out, they dispose of in the lowest cost way or the only way available to them. And it often ends up in rivers, which often end up in our oceans. So we, we look at this, in the, in particularly in the developing world, where they, have not, they don't have the nice MRFs that we have often or the, the nice, let's quote, nice landfill so that we have. Um, so they do what they have what available. It's sort of get it, get it out of my backyard. We say, oh my gosh, how could they possibly do this? Well, one of the reasons they often dip, they dump them down a ravine or a river is because the rivers are actually self-cleaning. So they dump it down the river, a rain comes, it disappears, and they can continue dumping it in the same river. It's out of sight, out of mind. And again, we say, oh my gosh, how could they possibly be doing this? But it's very similar to our own, I would argue, our own not-in-my-backyard environmental arbitrage that we practice every day with much of our waste in the developed world. In fact, I would ask you to consider what's the difference between us shipping our problematic waste onto 40-foot sea land containers, putting them on a ship, sending them to one of these uh, informal sectors for low-cost recycling, and having them dispose of the byproducts in inappropriate ways. What's the difference between that and them doing it with their own waste? Well, the difference is that we have a choice. They don't. They don't have, often don't have, the waste management infrastructure there, so they don't really have a choice. But we do. So, to put this in perspective, I like to use this analogy. We seem to care about how our stuff is made. How many of you remember the, uh, the, the problems that Nike and other uh, uh, sporting goods apparel manufacturers got in trouble a couple of decades ago for the sweatshop works, uh, the outsourcing? So Nike very quickly addressed this because they saw it as a serious problem to their sales of their products because people really cared. More recently, Apple has come, come under very similar pressure for how its products are made. I'm just picking two examples. There's actually quite a few more on how stuff is made. In fact, Apple was just in the press just last week again on a different manufacturer, uh, outsourced manufacturer. So we, as a public in the developed world, we seem to care how our stuff is made, therefore we should care much more dramatically how it's unmade. Because how it's unmade has much more uh, impact on the people make, doing the unmaking and on the local system, uh, ecosystems around that unmaking activity. So, 20 years, 25 years ago, I asked the question, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to harvest this valuable resource. Can we begin looking at trash differently, particularly plastic-rich trash? And that's when I started MBA Polymers. I looked at the traditional way of making plastics from oil using a big chemical factory. And I said, a more sustainable business model first starts with waste instead of oil. There's plenty of it, and its costs aren't directly tied to the price of oil. And instead of building a big chemical factory, that hard work's already been done. I said miners have figured out how to separate very minute amounts of materials from rock. Can't we figure out how to separate materials from our waste? And indeed, we were able to do it with a mechanical recycling approach, which gives us much lower capital costs. We save 80 to 90% of the energy compared to making plastics from petrochemicals. We only use 10 to 20% and our plants are more flexible. So instead of building a hundreds of millions of dollar plant that will only make one type of plastic for its whole life, our plants make any type of plastic we feed them. And the other breakthrough is that we're able to make a direct replacement for virgin. In fact, I have to change this because a Swiss research 
uh, firm just did an LCA uh, analysis on our process, and we actually save three to four tons of CO2 for every ton of virgin plastic we replace. We close the loop with manufacturers, and they get to make more sustainable products. Manufacturers use our material at 100% replacement for virgin. They don't dilute it with virgin. So in summary, we're not only a very high-tech company, we cracked the really hard code, if you will, on how to recycle plastics from complex waste streams. We've built three world-scale plants, one in China, one in Austria, and one in the UK. You might ask why we're overseas. Well, it's because that's where the mines are. That's where the policy is in place that I can go after the plastics in a cost-effective way. These plants are super high-tech. Uh, they are the most advanced recycling plastic plants on the planet. To combined, they process about 300 million pounds of plastic a year. I would show you a video, but in the interest of time, I'll just refer you, I'll, I'll give you some resources, and I think they'll be on the website for this conference uh, that can take you to videos and uh, show you more about how the process works. So in short, MBA Polymers developed a, not only technologies, but a business that is able to worldwide take some of the most complex waste streams in the world and make a brand new plastic that goes right back in to some of the products that you have in your homes and your offices at a one-to-one -one replacement for Virgin. These are the resources I referred to, and I'm, I'm giving you these just so you, if you're interested in this space, you can learn more about it than I'm able to communicate in 20 minutes. But also to point out, if you notice the, the top three, the TED Talk, uh, CNN, in fact, the CNN story just came out a few weeks ago, and uh, the big shift are all short videos, because we all have short attention spans, and done in a very compelling way that tell the story. And they sought us, us out. I did not try to do any of these. They sought it out because they see plastic waste as an important problem to be solved. So all of you in this room are part of that solution. And my message to you is that I've been shocked just in the past two years of how much people around the world care about this problem, and they particularly care about finding solutions. So if you can find a solution to their plastic waste problem, I'm here to tell you that the world is ready for it and eager to help you deliver that solution locally. Thank you.